Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Cheeky Natives. Um, today we have a very special guest yeah. uh, for many reasons, which I will allow Dr. Alma to get into. <laughs> Uh, so our guest on today's episode of the Cheeky Nations, which is a live recording, is Mohale Mashiko. Mohale Mashiko is very special to the Cheeky Nations for a number of reasons. Um, post her launch of The Yearning at Bridge Books in town, we had such an amazing time and we fanned girls so much that we decided to start a podcast. But I, I think what we need to talk about is how we stalked her and basically Yay. forced her to come onto the Cheeky Natives when we were on Twitter. So proceeding The Yearning, we basically had a two hour conversation and we were like... <laughs> and now you have my personal number so you harass me even more. <laughs> <laughs> to tag her and stuff after reading The Yearning also because then I add like forced everybody around me to buy the yearning and people were like if you're gonna make us buy this book you better talk to this author and i'm like oh my gosh okay i need to make the part you guys made it a bestseller <laughs> your power influenza <laughs> and it's also been reprinted and a million it is now times. a million times it is now shortlisted it was shortlisted, shortlisted it then. won like i'm even losing track Basically. my sister so before we get into your sophomore um collection of sort of stories we nice. want to talk about um post life post the yearning right so you wrote this really incredible story about maribeni mm. you know i still quote the start of the yearning mm. to people mm. every time i meet them i'm like if you want to read a book just read the first line mm. you know my mother died seven times before she gave birth to mm. me i'm grateful for the corpse that always seemed to resurrect itself mm. oh, like okay. i really and from we low-key judge people who say they're into South African books and haven't read The Yearning. Right? That's true. Low-key judge <laughs> them, but high-key tell them. Uh-uh, no judgment. <laughs> it's so, a bestseller, they'll get around to it. So we want to know like... like sooner, sooner, <laughs> sooner, better, sooner, rather than, <laughs> than later. later. Also, lo like, did you hear that low-key humble brag? I'd say it's a bestseller. Best <laughs> no, that's a free, yeah, that's a free, um, yeah. So we want to know like, how, what, how, what does life look like post The Yearning, obviously, and winning the debut prize for the UJ prize. How, how has that been for you, for your confidence as a writer? Well, firstly, um, and someone from the publishers here, so maybe she knows, but uh, when we the day we went to print, I sent a very long, weepy email saying, look, I don't think the book is that good. Can you please give me another 10 years to write? And I promise you it'll be perfect. And my publisher, Andrea, said, I get this all the time from authors, and I'm sorry to tell you, but it's being printed now as we are speaking. <laughs> You're going to be okay. You're not getting another 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I was really worried because then I went to Franz Schuch Literary Festival, and literally it was all like old ladies sitting there. And I was talking about this book, and I, I said to them, it's imposter syndrome, but mm. I feel like I'm making you guys buy a rubbish book. And I do apologize in advance. But then it was sold out. See, I forgot to tell you, <laughs> it was sold out. Even after I told the people it's a rubbish book. So it's just been weird. I mm. feel like Mohale Mashiko, that's not even my real name. My, <laughs> so Mohale Mashiko has kind of taken over my life. Yeah. I haven't been able to make music and I feel like I created a monster, honestly. The other day at the airport, I'm tired, <laughs> it's at night, and I hear somebody go, oh my God, Mahala Mashiko. <laughs> Forget it's not my real name. Pull my bag into that Woolies, and then I say, hi, I'm so, so, I'm so bad with uh, names and faces, and I always tell them I'm often drunk. It's a good excuse. <laughs> um, and then she says, oh, I know you from your book. You did not holler my name <laughs> from where I was to tell me I know you from your book. And then I shook her hand and she was like, it's so lovely to meet you. And I walked away. I was like, anytime somebody shouts Mohala Mashiha, I'm just going to keep walking <laughs> because it's not even my real name. But that's how tired I was. Mm -hmm. I went to a complete stranger and I was like, I'm often drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, you you mentioned a lot of the sort of stress and anxiety that you felt with your first book. Yeah. And then this book was super successful and everybody loved it and we all stalked you um, post reading this book, guys, because we all had questions. Uh, we still have questions. Y'all, you, know, you know we deserve those answers. <laughs> You're not going to get the answers. <laughs> but it's fine. I can't. Don't yell. I can't. Um, 
now you write the second book and you've had all of this acclaim and this critical acclaim, this book's won prizes, everybody's just crazy over the book. You now write a second book. How did that change the way that you'd approached writing the second book? I'd started writing these stories um, while I was working on the yearning. So I'm often working on like mm. two stories at a time. I don't know if it's like a concentration problem, but mm. I just feel I, I work better if I'm working on two stories. Mm. So. When, when, when I started writing some of these stories, I had not become the person that people call at an airport <laughs> or any of that madness. So I felt no pressure, um, although my publisher said, I know you're probably scared because, you know, uh, critical acclaim or whatever. And I said, actually, I'm scared because I don't think people are ready for what I'm writing. Mm. Mm. Okay. Why, okay. Did you, why did you feel that people weren't ready for what you were writing? Because speculative fiction is always about a special boy whose uh, father or grandfather died, hire Peter Parker. And <laughs> oh, you know, wow. he gets bitten by a radioactive Shame. spider. And it, it, this stuff is always for other people, mm, but mm. it's never for people like us. Mm, so, mm. you know, a mermaid from Soweto, uh, a werewolf from Mitchell's Plain who falls in love with a vampire from Limpopo. And I was just like, I think, I think I've gone too far and maybe we should save it for later. Mm. But she read the stories, and I'm, I'm such a lazy writer, I sent her four stories, and then she's like, okay, where's the rest? I, I, then I sent her another two. Then she's like, no, but where's everything? <laughs> and once she read everything, she said it would be crazy not to publish this. I mean, I think before starting, in, and you did this when you, there was a reprint of uh, The Yearning, you wrote like a little essay, but you also wrote an author, author's note mm. in the start of Intruders. Would it be, can we ask you to read the author's note? Okay, didn't I come here to read? Can I have a fan? So you're here to do everything. So, um, so, sorry, for those of you who have your Bibles, and if you don't, we hope this will encourage you to buy your book after this because you have so much FOMO. Please turn to the author's notes. It's on page seven. I was going to be it's on page V I I. I I was like, one, two. <laughs> I took a moment to be like, is it okay? I'm sure it's seven. None you can't take me anywhere. <laughs> okay, so uh, the author's note says. This one is for a girl who always saves a boy who lived. For delicate and invisible boys, lost souls with praying mothers, even a heathen like me has a praying mother, those who raise themselves in a world that doesn't care whether they live or die, the progeny of forgotten legends, those who've lost too much and have nothing but themselves, for young love and heartbreak, and old heartbreak, the ones who fall asleep with a man and wake up next to a monster, for monster slayers and makers, for those who were spat out onto the streets, for the weird, the wonderful, and us who never see ourselves in the stars but die in seas searching for them. You are everything. Okay, my sister. So, <laughs> so why did you feel it was necessary for you to start these collection of store short stories with an author's note? Um, so I've just been thinking about what a horror story South Africa is. I mean, if people were watching, if this was a movie, everybody in the cinema would be going, why is no one running? Why is no one trying to get rid of the zombies? You know, so I, the, the horror of living in South Africa for me um, made me realize that there are people who are invisible. And I wanted to let them know that I wrote this book for mm. them and about them. That's why it's called Intruders, because we are intruding on what they call speculative fiction. We are intruding on being in the background. So we are, you know, we are the, the protagonist. Mm. And I think I also wrote it for myself because I was going through a bad time. And I, I needed people like me and people who are forgotten or invisible to know that you are everything and you are seen. Mm -hmm. Even when you don't feel seen, we see you. So prior to this, you were working, you have been working on Kwezi. Mm -hmm. And Kwezi, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's just this amazing, I don't want to say cartoon, cartoons? Comics, comics. 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 It's, it's a comic book. book. It's a comic book. book. It's a comic book. 
comic books, <laughs> right? And um, it's just been really interesting because we previously hadn't had anything like like crazy, right? Um, and I'm just curious how writing crazy and having that previous experience then influenced the ways in which you wrote this book. Oh, I, I said I'd never say it again, but he's not here, so he won't hear me. Uh, Lois Omkiza always says, it doesn't matter what you're creating, mm. it's the energy behind it. Mm. And believe it or not, the person who is going to receive the art is going to see it, is going to read it, understands the energy. Mm. So all of my feelings about, you know, being so afraid that it may be too soon to have a book like this went away when I thought about it. But also, writing Quasi has made me a little braver mm. in where I take the story, you know. I'm just like, come on, like, we draw, uh, uh, there's a guy in Kwezi who's uh, a mayor, but he's a bad guy and he turns into a hyena. And if I, it, listen, if I can tell that story, then I feel brave <laughs> enough to tell these mm. ones as well. Mm. And so there was the first African Comic Con happening a few weeks ago, um, and you were there, and how was that? It was great because I didn't get nerd flu. So if you ever go to a con, people shake your hand and they've been holding their books forever and then they hand them over to you to sign and then you go home and you have nerd flu for a week. And there were 35,000 people there and people handling me the whole time and touching my face as well. So besides that, it was wonderful. I didn't get nerd flu. Um, but also I realized that I am currently one of the only black women who's working on a commercial comic book. And that was really sad because on all the panels, it was just me. And I was like, I guess I'm an intruder. And now I want to train another black woman mm -hmm. to take over from when I leave Quasi so that there's more of us. There's got to be more of us doing this fun stuff, man. Mm -hmm. Not every time a doctor, but we need doctors. <laughs> 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 On the morning that we are late, because of my doctor, I collect my drag. Um, so for me, I think um, Alma and I were having a conversation, you know, throughout reading the book and preparing for the podcast about how, I mean, um, Lauren uh, Bukas also describes it as subversive and electric and achingly familiar. Mm. And I, I, I describe it as hauntingly familiar, mm. right? For me, it was hauntingly familiar because these are some of the stories that I grew up with, right? Mm. Some of the, let's call them urgent legends, right? Um, and, I, and I think it's important what you say about like, people who see you who look like you so for me that was what was important the important part was seeing myself in this speculative fiction right but i also want to say that i i think more than a work of fiction this is an academic work right so you start it, it really is and we'll get back we'll get into that uh, um, you, you start the book uh, by talking about Messi Pakena, right? And mm. you're saying perhaps she was a philosopher because when she was talking about Ayachi Samadeki, this is not my size. Perhaps she was talking about this idea. Mm. And you, you link this idea to what we've come to know as Afrofuturism, mm. right? Mm. So I, we wanted to spend a bit of more time talking about Afrofuturism and what Afrofuturism, mm. um, why you wanted to start intruders by talking about Afrofuturism first. Oh, yesterday I was on Azania's show and I said something and now the cool kids are going to hate me. Hi. I'm saying hi to Nkateko. He's like, <laughs> he's like, why is she waving at me? <laughs> okay, so do you have that definition in, in the... So Mark Derry, funny enough, he's, he's a white man and he was writing... Uh, <laughs> this is what's so funny about this. He's a white man who was writing about science fiction and the story, the, the essay is called Black to the Future. And he spoke to three people who were actually writing speculative fiction or what was then called sci-fi. And he said speculative fiction that addresses African-American themes and addresses African-American concerns in the context of 20th century technoculture and more generally African-American signification that appropriates images of technology and a prosthetically enhanced future might want for a better term be called Afrofuturism. And that's great, but I, we've been having um, uh, you know, being a majority, so I don't have those kind of representation issues. And I think Afrofuturism is very important. 
So Mark Derry talks about how Afrofuturism. Okay, so Afrofuturism is important for um, African Americans who are always a minority mm -hmm. in their country mm -hmm. and have to imagine a, a black future, which mm -hmm. is what often happens in a lot of Afrofuturism. And also they're in control of the technology because of the technology that was used, you know, on them in slavery, mm -hmm. all of that kind of you know, horrible stuff. But then I thought about it for a while and I was like, we're such culture vultures. We want everything. We want everything. You call it cultural imperialism? That, mm. Cultural imperialism. And we are, we're culture vultures. <laughs> Anything that comes from, you know, either the UK or the US, we're on it. Mm. And I mean, you can hear guys talk, uh, calling each other brav and talking about paying sneakers and all of that. And I was like, at some <laughs> point, we're going to have to take a minute and think about is Afrofuturism for us? Mm -hmm. And it's not. And I'll tell you why it's not. Because our experiences are so different as Africans living in Africa mm -hmm. that I can't dream of a, a world full of black people because, hello, all around me. But also, I. I don't like the idea of just dreaming of the future and not, you know, dreaming of a fantastical now. So I give, I leave a, a there's a line there that's left in there and I'm saying you can call it whatever you want to call it, but don't call it Afrofuturism because then you're just parroting something that doesn't belong to you. Mm. And I think this is a good time for us to start, you know, really breaking down the things that we just take wholesale mm -hmm. and i'm not saying the diaspora doesn't deserve mm -hmm. afrofuturism they do there are people who write it really well i just think it would be a joke if we if we just took afrofuturism as a whole thing also i said when i saw pictures of people at Afro, this is this is the one that i shouldn't have said on azania's show but i said it now when I saw pics of uh, the people at Afropunk in Joburg, all it looked like was they were cosplaying someone who was cosplaying them. Mm. And when you have a culture, you don't need to cosplay what somebody who doesn't or who is desperate for it to, to have a culture. You don't, you don't cosplay that. You've had your culture your whole life. You've lived around black people your whole life. So even when they're like, oh, so much blackness, I'm like, are you joking? It, like, is this an actual joke? So I did say that I, I saw a lot of people at Afropunk who were cosplaying, somebody cosplaying them. And we just, we need to start interrogating the things that we take wholesale mm -hmm. from the States and the UK because not all of it is for us. And that's going to make me unpopular again. Now I'm afraid to go to young's, like young people's spaces because I'm afraid somebody's <laughs> going to slap me for saying they were cosplaying someone who was cosplaying them. So, you were, a lot of the stories here, uh, like the talking was saying, are kind of rooted in urban legend. Like I know the story of the Verons, for example, right? Um, and and if you if you if you haven't really heard the story of the Verons, right? It's about these woman that she encounters it's always on a highway like that was the story it's always on a highway someone will get into your car and then they'll be like please drop me off at some destination and then you'll wake up at their grave sites or something equally as salacious right which you never just wake up in your car because no, that's boring mm -hmm. you always land up <laughs> at the grave sites or in somebody's house and then you'll be like oh no i came with mohale and they're like no but mohale died 20 years ago uh what do you mean and I found it really, it was for both of us, it was really interesting. It was really cool to find that she used a lot of childhood urban legends that we could, we could relate to in writing these stories. And so we just wanted to know, I mean, you could have written completely different stories that had nothing to do with really anything that any of us could relate to, but why did you choose to use those very particular contextual stories to, to write, to write? Because we, uh, you know, 
we've been having speculative fiction. We just didn't know mm. the Vera's the horse without a head, but that can save yes. lives. Make off like yes. how is the horse talking <laughs> if it doesn't have a head? <laughs> we didn't question any of that, so we've yeah. been having speculative yes. fiction. And I just wanted to turn it up a notch. And also, I'm convinced the Vera story was just a bunch of wives who were like, "Why are you driving at night? You're gonna wake <laughs> up in a, a gravesite. Stay home. Where are you going?" <laughs> You know, trying to keep their husbands and, and, and sons home. But I do I do feel like we've been having speculative fiction. We, we've been having it, as they say. So for me, it was just, how do I take something that we know and turn it up a notch or take it in a different direction? So you have a different direction. There's a lot of social commentary in the book that Klochen and I have found. Um, so with the Veras, no, no. <laughs> With the Veras, right, um, you talk about how it's, it's a collection of spirits of women who have been murdered by, by men, right? Um, and they're then emboldened by like an event that happens. And we were talking about just in the past year how much we've heard about femicide in this country. And it's an interesting social commentary. Imagine if all of the women in this country who have been murdered by men were to actually rise up, for example, like the Veras. What would, what would that look like? There would be so few men in this country, we'd have to import them in from other. We have to call Nigeria. Do you perhaps have 20,000 men for us because ours are dead? Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't know about the, the, the social commentary bit until I finished reading this thing and I realized that I, I wrote a lot of these stories when I was depressed about being a South African living in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And you don't know the person behind the headline, man. Mm -hmm. You always hear a woman something something bad mm -hmm. and it's not even on the front page because it's it's so common mm -hmm. and I just wanted to take uh, an urban legend like Vera and turn it up a notch because I'm so tired of hearing about women being killed by their intimate partners mm -hmm. or yet by a stranger mm -hmm. just walk up to a woman and be like okay I'm here to kill you mm -hmm. you know and I <laughs> <laughs> when yeah, yeah, when I say it like that, it sounds terrible. But um, I just, I was just tired of it, and I thought, what would happen if Vera wasn't just one ghost that was keeping men from driving at night to go and see their sides, and <laughs> <laughs> and it actually became something that was terrible, you know? Mm -hmm. Because I'm so tired of hearing about women dying in South Africa. So when I wrote that, I, I did, I was exhausted about the horror of living in this country and how okay we are with living in a horror story. And I think also linked to that is the idea of this futuristic, right? So it's imagining this future. And it appears that a lot of the story imagine a future where women are the protagonists mm -hmm. of their own lives, right? So the men in, 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 in most of these stories are already peripheral. Um, was that intentional? Uh, yes. Because, uh, I'm going to forget, is it Star Trek Voyager, the one with the, the black woman, Michael yes. somebody. Anyway, it was such a big deal. Mm. It was such a big deal that on this spaceship that's been go gone all over, even collected Klingons, it, it was <laughs> unbelievable that a black woman was going to save the day. And I was so exhausted with us applauding people for doing silly things like that, that I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put a bunch of badass black women, the, the one woman kills a man in the taxi rank with her high heel, the high heel killer, yes, queen. you know, one ends up in space. Just I, I, And I also, I think women in South Africa deserve to know that we see you mm. and, and we know that you're saving the day every day and you're the glue that's holding this horror story together because really if one day we decided we're done and we move to Nigeria because there are nice men in Nigeria, <laughs> men over here would have to call a country that would not take their calls. They'd be like, oh, South Africa, you need women. Sorry, <laughs> rip easy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry, South Africa. So I think I, I wanted women to know that they, they can't be they can't be the badass. It's not just Peter Parker. It's not just Tony Stark. You know, it's not it, Superman. Yeah. Uh, now you leave Superman alone. Oh, he, wow. He's an alien. <laughs> <laughs> leave him out of this. Um, 
but also connected to that it seems in this futuristic world there's still like a lot of social ills that are happening right so we don't completely reimagine a new world right mm -hmm. so um so the one story that well most of the stories also seems that there's still violence and patriarchy is mm -hmm. still there right mm -hmm. but the one story the spaceship story there seems to be a lot of class distinction mm -hmm. so even so in this new way. world people are still like so let's call it a world outside of whiteness even the world outside of whiteness still has tinges of whiteness and still has tinges of class mm -hmm. was that was that also deliberate I kept on thinking about Elon Musk. What a, there's a kid here, so I'm gonna use a, a kid-friendly word. What a poopy face. Um, I hope that's a word you use, Nana, otherwise you just learned a new word, <laughs> poopy face. But, and I kept thinking about all of the people who can afford to be in a, in a spaceship, should this ball finally get tired of us and go, okay, today's the last day. All of those people, are people who are not in the same class as us. Mm. They're probably not even black people. I mean, Oprah will definitely be there. I want the Oprah spaceship. But the the spaceship themselves, you don't you don't go into space and then suddenly forget racism and classism and sexism because you know the world has has blown up. So in this particular story where one of the sisters does end up in space, mm -hmm. it becomes very obvious who built the spaceship and who, who it was made for. And the fact that, you know, you still have to do some work. It's like, oh no, you can be here. And then all of a sudden, you don't have access to the, the nice library uh, because you're not doing the work. You know, because the, you're in cabin X, whatever. I can't remember what I call yeah. these cabins. But I mean, racism, sexism, the patriarchy, uh, homophobia, all, all of the phobias don't go away because we're in space. Mm -hmm. And they won't go away because in space, because the people who can afford to actually put us on ships mm -hmm. are poopy faces. So spirituality comes up in the book in different ways, right? I mean, the story of, it's like Little Red Riding Hood right at the end. But Zilani. 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 Like, yeah. And, um, and Manuka as well, who's just... Um, but it comes up often, right? And I, and I think that it's sort of like a theme that weaves throughout triples because the union was also quite... Ruby had like a spiritual thing going on mm -hmm. in the union. Mm -hmm. And there's, it seems to be like a, a continuing spiritual theme even in that. Like even in this Afro-futuristic world that we're trying to reimagine, spirituality comes up quite often. And I just, I find it really interesting because of how you often describe yourself as a, as a heathen and an end. You know you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I so, come from a very spiritual family. Um, On my mother's side, there's... You, you, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who is not Isangwama or mm -hmm. like a, a priest or mm -hmm. a, a prophet or whatever. So uh, growing up around really spiritual people was interesting for me because I'd always listen to what they were saying. And I mean, yes, I'm a heathen. <laughs> I think maybe, let's say atheist. God, why did I write heathen? What a bad word. Right? In the second edition, I'm going to have to write atheist as he's. Um, <laughs> Oh, heathen is such a strong right. word. <laughs> but uh, I grew up around very spiritual mm -hmm. people from my mom's side of the family. And I didn't think it affected me until I saw it come through in my writing. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, sp spirituality has got so much, so much power mm -hmm. in people's lives, regardless of whether you believe in a god or ancestors or whatever. It's got a lot of power and it's, it's got a place. It's got a place, and you know, black people love church. Mm. So, you know, I had to say something about somebody's grandmother going to love church. So, I had to say something about somebody's grandmother going to church. But I, it was important to me once I realized how it was. It, it was a theme that was coming through, and I never want to separate who I am now, a heathen. <laughs> to, you know, from who I was, mm -hmm. and I was a child who grew up around really spiritual people. So there's this, there's an untitled story which it takes part in three parts, right? And obviously there's a novel there, right? Because we deserve one. You know, it's called Untitled 1, 2, 3, and then the book ends. <laughs> Why Ubata 4, 5, 6, 7? <laughs> That's 
that's not how short stories work. <laughs> well, you see, that is the that's thing, right? You were like one, two, three. And I was like, but wait. It's four, five, six. There must be more chapters to Kamo and Bonola. I want to know what's happening in Out of Space and here in the Joburg, but not Joburg. I uh, know, in post apocalyptic <laughs> South Africa. Why don't uh, you, somebody from my publisher is here now, and don't snitch, Eileen. But I'm already working on Untitled. Ah, because okay. we deserve I think, it. I, I feel like these girls deserve more Thanks. time than I gave them. They were actually just like a little break from the heaviness of, you know, the other stories. I don't know if they were a break, Mohale, because wow, those girls go through it, right? It's like, they go through it in the book. It's really interesting that you think they were a break. I think they were some of the heavier characters in the story, because you, you, really? you develop an attachment to them. So it's the siblings, like, I can think of my brother and I interacting that way. I can think of my brother, for example, wanting me to get onto the, onto the spaceship and, and get rescued and him staying behind like those are relationships that you can think of it's not you left your sibling behind post apocalyptic joke these things happen <laughs> not every time taking your brother and sister <laughs> but no i thought that, that i thought i loved untitled because i thought it's such a break from all of the murder and you know the the ghosts and and the horror and i thought what a what a nice what a very nice break. But this apparently is why we were attached to them, right? Like <laughs> because we just want to know what happens to these girls. Like and also because they're young, right? Like you can see your little cousin in them. You can see that they're young. They're these young girls who have no family to speak of. They just have each other and then you separate them. Like so, you're wrong for that. So I just want you to read like a paragraph from Untitled yes. Three. Um can you start reading here from Bonolo Means? And then just Page ending it right here. So for, for those, those of who have you, your Bible, Bibles, 164. 164. So where do you want me to start just, reading from? Just here from Bonolo until the end of this. Okay. Mm. Bonolo means easy or uncomplicated, but nothing except her birth was easy for my sister. Mm. Bonolo was a child genius who got straight A's, went to university before her age mates, graduated and never became the engineer she wanted to be. Instead, she grew tired of the job rejection letters and ended up working as a secretary for a GP. She'd also decided that being smart was a disadvantage, so she played small and unremarkable until she started to believe it. And that really has, 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 has stayed with me, right? Because I think that it's a lot of social commentary that mm. speaks a, a lot about like what we as particularly black and brown people go through in this country, mm. right? So you've got this... I, I read a thread the other day of this person saying, you know, they studied at UCT, they went to Oxford, but they spent about two years looking for a job, mm. right? And this idea that, like Bonolo, get an education, go to university and everything will be fine. But everything is not going to be fine no. because like the construction of corporate South Africa in this country is still white, right? So you can be an, as excellent a black person as ever, but if you don't have the connections and if you can't get in, you can't get in, no UCT degree or Oxford degree is going to get you in. So I wanted to know in your breaking, you were <laughs> touching on really like intense social commentary yeah. about like what uh, structural inequality looks like for black people in this country. But also for me, it was, it was, it, it was, was, hey, he must use his Yuseli English. Um, but also it was, a, it was, it was, to add on to that, it was a commentary on black excellence. I think we're having real conversations about black excellence right now. And, and the ways in which black excellence also serves as a barrier for other black people, right? It's barriers of entry, like, but uh, the idea that you, that black people are constantly held to a standard of excellence that doesn't apply for anybody else. So before you can even get a foot in the door, you need to be excellent in ways in which other people are allowed to be mediocre. I mean, had Bunolo been a young white girl, she'd be flourishing. Like, who would be sending her rejection letters, you know? And the idea that black women's lives and black women's dreams are always a story of, like, a dream deferred, a dream I had to put aside because I have a younger sister I must raise or because there's this world that just cannot fathom the idea of, of black women wanting to be anything outside of what they've decided we must be was such an interesting commentary to make in this particular section. Well, in that one paragraph, guys, we got all of this. <laughs> I'm so smart. <laughs> yes. Um, no, but you see, in a short story, there's no time to like 
tell the story of the, the rejection letters because a short story is like CrossFit, I keep saying, you know. In CrossFit you go until you vomit apparently, which is why I'm not going to go to CrossFit because <laughs> why are we exercising till we vomit? <laughs> and writing a novel is like practicing for a marathon and you have time. And in this one story I just wanted to show that Monolo is not, she's not down. Uh, and she's she's like a lot of people who are sitting at home without a job. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. have they have the degrees and they they're very very smart, mm -hmm. but they're sitting at home mm -hmm. or even taking jobs of being a, a GP's secretary mm -hmm. or receptionist because mm -hmm. there's nothing else to do. So you do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And I think this this story untitled for me was they were both doing what they had to do. Mm -hmm even when she's saying Bonolo away. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what's been really interesting is how openly you speak about mental health, right? And this happened when you were writing The Yearning, mm -hmm. but even more prominently uh, now, right? And why do you think it's important for you as, or why do you think it's important for Mohale? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for, for Mohale to speak about mental health. And I'm asking this particularly in light of what we know what happened at UCT oh, with uh, Professor Mayosi, uh, that people think when you have these awards and these accolades that everything is hanky-dory. So why do you think it's important for you to speak so openly about mental health? Uh, because there's a lot of shame and I wish I could say I have no shame when I think about some of my mental illnesses, but there's a lot of shame and I just want somebody to be like, well, if that crazy drunk auntie on Twitter can talk about, you know, the fact that she's she's having a bad day, she's she's feeling anxiety or she's depressed, then maybe they can tell someone. Because the thing about mental illness is it's so isolating. Mm -hmm. It's so isolating because if you try to explain to somebody, I cannot go to the shop, I cannot leave the house, somebody is probably going to be like it's because yeah it's lay you know you you just you're, you're just lazy mm. and also trying to explain the emptiness of depression is exhausting in itself and i just i talk about it because i want people to know that it's okay to not be okay mm. Mm. So the book is divided into three parts, the good, the bad, and the colorful. I just want to say I didn't see the good. Yeah. I was just like, uh, ha! is this the good? <laughs> Where is the good? I was like, Woo! ghost ring. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the goodness in a ghost wow. ring? Wow, <laughs> this is the sound of Mahan walking away. <laughs> <laughs> I am so curious as to, firstly, how? <laughs> How is this the okay. good? The and so the, the division, the why you guys, did you, you don't see positivity? You're always just thinking <laughs> negative. Now let me see. The good, Manoka, first of all, she finally discovers who she is. Yeah. She was an well, outsider. So I saw the, the good so there. The when, good she, there. <laughs> when she flows into the ocean. Doesn't Dimitra's family uh, uh, agree with the, the goodness of her family? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, his family is <laughs> not important. <laughs> not important to I the mean, story. <laughs> Go strain in is do you know when men know that their friend is rubbish mm. and they carry them around their whole lives yes. and they even give you a warning they're like my friend's a little weird which means he's like predatory mm. and they carry them around mm. and this time this boy carried around his friend who was a zombie because they found each other and I wanted to tell a story about like tender boys mm. who aren't necessarily the best kids hey mm. they're not they train surf they do dumb stuff they do poopy face stuff <laughs> and um uh, is the baby sleeping mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 they do poopy face stuff but they found each other mm. and I, it, the, the good for me was the male friendship and the fact that he carried his zombie friend in a coffin around because he believed that there would be a cure one day mm. yeah, oh good. no so this is what i was talking to Alma. i was talking about especially <laughs> ghost train right it speaks a it's a deliberate attempt to speak about like male intimacy right yeah and, and how the, the softness of, yes. of and tenderness of, of males that we don't speak about because mm. it's always this narrative of obochu in, in or, or strong or masculine you are the one but Eventually the good, but I'm just saying these stories were not not the good. Ah, I ah, thought we ah, people are gonna fall in love. It's gonna be amazing. <laughs> and, 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 
first of all, Manuka fell in love, and these two love each other so much that the one is carrying his friend <laughs> in a coffin in the zombie apocalypse. But it's also um, very humanizing. I mean, so you think of those, I thought of the way you portrayed the strain, you know, like it started off as a, as a, as a strain in a certain part of the, I don't want to give away too much, I get people must buy the book. Then I tell so the stories. It started off as a strain in one part of, of the city and then moved on to more affluent parts of the city. And often when you think about these boys, like you'll hear people throw terms like, ha, I want to a boy around, you know, but there's no sort of understanding of the humanity behind that, right? No one ever thinks, it's, oh, you know, this was a person that had a mother or a sister who loved them, that there's a person behind the addiction or behind the substance use. And for me, this was, this really really humanize them. I, they, it was a little bit creepy that he walked around with his friend. But it, that's you know, what men do. They <laughs> carry their dead friends around. Instead of saying, hey dude, you're been you, great. you know, you, you need to change your life or go. Yeah. No, they will literally carry them around in coffins forever and ever. Um, okay, the Palermo. I'm trying to think why I said it was good. Oh, it's good because it talks a lot about gentrification yes. and the fact that we forget, we forgive, we forgive men. So it's like a man will do a really bad thing to you. And then two weeks later, hi, babe, <laughs> when is that vacation? So for me, it was about the, the, the goodness of memories and how important it is to, to remember. And to keep remembering that, no, this guy when not other bad. Like he, he was bad from day one. Just because now we're going on vacation to Mauritius, <laughs> you know. That's cool. <laughs> and, and now So for me, it was the importance. And what makes it good is that um, it's also about the city, the the, the inner, you know, the, the the CBD about how horrific this place is and how filled with blood it is and how people are trying to renew it but how good the, 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 the goodness of memories when you try to renew a place don't ever forget what was happening mm. and erase it so it was about the goodness of memories oh an untitled one well that was just good because a sister saved her sister's life so that's all the, it was good it was so negative <laughs> I'm just like, you're so negative. I hear you, like, you know, you must be really optimistic, but some of these stories are like, I was like, this is the good, what is the bad? Yeah. Like, if this is the good, what is the bad? The colorful I could see, the yeah. colorful I, I, I really could see. But I think, like, in all in all, I this, your sophomore collection, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. is actually something that we need. And I had said mm. earlier, uh, that it's academic and I was saying this because I think that we're starting to reimagine ourselves mm. as an Africa mm. living in Africa as black people mm. and these stories are something that we can draw back into and say okay what does it look like for black people living mm. in Africa thinking futuristically speculative because I also think although it's speculative fictions there are a lot of social commentaries that aren't speculative we know people are dying out here like um, and I think that we're going to use this to start thinking about looking at bubblegum music you know I was thinking about Born to Kwaito which is sort of bringing our stories into the into the, the fora of mm. the academy. So and I we're think so bad at archiving mm. and just you know looking at the culture that we're creating that Ten years from now, some Swedish guy is going to come and he's going to be like, this interesting thing happened in South Africa and I'm going to write about it. Uh, because we don't document and, and we don't archive. Yeah. And also, I mean, reading this and, and then being able to relate to so many, because you always used to hear about like, Abo Vater Messi. I know, y'all know those stories. So you, I'm still haunted by Varus Mekop. But how is the host talking if it doesn't have a head? We were so, we were so dumb and scared. We were like, how is the host? We didn't ask. Scary thing, right? Yes. That the host without a head. Yes. I was Pinky Pinky. We were all scared of Pinky Pinky. I think we were just scared. know what she was scared of, but she was scared of Pinky Pinky. We were just scared. You can't go. I remember in primary school, you didn't go to the toilet by yourself. You called a friend because Pinky Pinky is going to deal with you if you go by yourself. Listen. And then you watch Harry Potter and you see Moaning Myrtle, and I'm like, Pinky Pinky. So I just put it in a nice movie and flourish. Like, the situation and was like, this is Pinky Pinky. But also, like, I was thinking about this when I was reading the story about the telling of our stories right so like when you watch these um speculative fiction mm. harry potter mm. star trek da 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 you're like hey matt 
people have been talking about this like in our communities yeah. but we just haven't been creating so right so who has the ownership to tell our stories and i think that intruders mm. is starting to have this conversation that actually there are urban legends that we aren't talking about we aren't talking about i was reading an article about Ubuntu as an uh, Afrofuturism concept, right? So someone was like talking... Imran, Imran, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, and I was, talk, I, was, I, was, I was like, maybe we should talk about this offline because, you know, some people <laughs> might want to sponsor us. So <laughs> and and let's talk about it offline because <laughs> I have a lot to say about that. But it also speaks to the idea that, that these stories are not outside of us, mm. right? That this idea of, of we don't always have to... And Kala Kaputsuma says it's so beautiful. How come... How come when people want to hear about black children's childhood, you never want to hear about the joy? You never yeah. want to hear about the creative things that were happening in black people's childhoods, right? Like, Pinky Pinky's creative, whoever sold us Pinky Pinky did an amazing job because a whole couple of generations of school children were afraid of going to the bathroom, right? It was the teacher, she was like, they go to the toilet all the time, <laughs> so I'm going to create a ghost, and I I'm going to tell the teachers. <laughs> That is resourcefulness right there, right? But she wants your kids. But it's also the idea that that we do we can, we are beginning to somebody asked me a question at the SA Book Fair and I just they said, Do you think that black there's been a development since in the writing of black writers? And then this person talked about Eskian Patel and Kantemba. I'm like, but like when did Eskian Patel and Kantemba write? To 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 use that as the as the standard of, of saying that black Black writers have not developed their identities, and I thought who that was this person? Uh, okay, guys, let's not. We'll maybe talk, about, we'll, we'll talk well. about it. We'll talk about it. But I mean, it speaks to that. Basically, it's anyone listening, we just need more money, you know, <laughs> to have more podcasts. Because with this book, I was I was thinking about that. With this book, twenty years ago, have had the kind of markets and the kind of audience that it does now like everybody is re- is reading the intruders you go on social media you go on twitter we're all uploading our books like yeah ask me you know? yes it's a bestseller hurry up <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, i think the, the other question we'd like to know obviously it would be remiss for us as a literary podcast to not ask like let's not go in your life let's just say in 2018 right what are some of the books that had you you know, taken aback. For us personally, one of the books, the best books we've read this year is The Ones With Purpose by Nozzy sure. Jalen. Yo, that book is just like, yeah. But also, obviously, Intruders is on the list. It is there. It is. The only one on the list, actually. <laughs> so what are some of the books that have really had you, you know, taken aback in 2018, particularly? Because black women have been, have been releasing this year. I think um, this thing happens to me after I publish a book, I lose my words. So I can't, I can't read. I can't write, uh, so I watch a show called Nailed It on Netflix. Really, these people cannot bake, and they're the worst. And afterwards, they have to show these monstrosity and go Nailed It. So I've been watching Nailed It, and a lot of come down with me, and a lot of my what is it called? My, my six hundred pound uh, life. Yeah. So I've I've lost my <laughs> words. So I haven't been able to read, but. The books that I have read that I thought were, were really beautiful is a book by Mariana. Oh, I'm gonna forget her surname. Yeah, just just Google there. But it's called Things We Lost in the Fire. Yes, 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 yes. And I met her and she's so blase. She's like, I was trying to do something and I don't know if I did it well, but at least I'm giving permission to other writers to write about this. She is so like, sexy creepy like <laughs> you just you know there's a story about a child being beheaded in i think it's like the first story and i was like this is so good this is so good not because of the child <laughs> but because she handles she handles and this is another book i can't finish because i've lost my words so i'm literally reading two pages at a time and i read another book by leslie necker Mm. a rima called mm. what happens when a man falls, falls from, from the sky. sky and it was before i started reading things we lost in the fire it was one of the best books i'd read this mm. year and i was gifting it to books masia give my give mariana man enrique ah oh, thank you you see 
should have just said Enrique Iglesias. I would have gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, Mariana Enrique is just she's she's so normal that when you read her books, you're like, hey, something is <laughs> happening in her mind. Mm. But those are the two books that I've been able to to read and actually finish. Also because it was part of my open book reading list. <laughs> so I had to finish them. And I'm trying to think what else was on my open book. Uh, I also had to read From the Wife, uh, but I had to read the whole series. And that took up quite a lot of time. So I think those, those books are the ones that I have been able to read, but now I've lost my words and I'm reading two pages <laughs> like a week. And this always happens after a book gets published. I just, I feel like I was immersed in words and now I don't know how to enjoy them properly. So I give myself time. Mm. So ask me this in two months. Okay. So what's next for, for you, Mohali? <laughs> Bonola and Kamuna. Bonola and Bonola Kamuna. Kamuna next year. Next year, this time. Wow, you know, guys, <laughs> I actually have to sit down and write these stories. Um, Remember again, we gave you line I last time? Don't <laughs> snitch. <laughs> <laughs> Use the line we gave you last time for the yearning to go write this. Remember, remember? I can't learn. You can't yeah, give me the keys to the land, <laughs> so I can't even go to my nice farm and sit on on those outside. You know those ugly outside chairs everybody has at a bride, and sit on one of those ugly outside bride chairs and write. I'm waiting for my land. Um, Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's next is there is a book I started writing, and I don't like to give the name because then the name will change uh, but it's a book I started writing before I finished the yearning and that's when Marcia said to me how you do one thing is how you do everything and if you can't finish the yearning you won't be able to finish this one so I've been working on it for a while and I think that will be not next year but the year after do you know what's super interesting about hearing Mahali talk about the books that she's writing or the stuff she's working on is how it took you 10 years to write I know. Book. <laughs> to write I the know. Yearning, and now two years. Years. Two years. she publishes a book. <laughs> um, do you feel, do you feel dragged? I'm so dragged. Wilding dragon. I thought this was about celebrating me. But the brief was wrong. I'm leaving. No, but the yearning took me so long because I didn't think I could be a writer. And even when I finished it, I sent it to Zakes after Marcia was like, send it to Zakes. For the listeners, Zakes and, Zakes and Da is yeah. her best friend. Yes, <laughs> he's my BFF. <laughs> and I sent it to Zakes and he said, I didn't know you were a writer. So I said, come on, you're an award-winning writer. I bet every second person you meet is like, I have this story. How can I write it? Or I'm a writer for sure. Just like inspire me. So, you know, and we were friends as well. And I didn't, and I felt like I was taking advantage of our friendship. But he read it and then he said, you know, go get it published. And you guys know the story. Mm -hmm. All the major publishers rejected it. One of them said, uh, we already have a book like this in the works. Where? Where is their bestseller? <laughs> These lying ass guys. <laughs> Where is their bestseller? <laughs> Anyway, those are her <laughs> personal views, <laughs> not that of the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay that the casual pulling out of her seat says, You become that auntie. You become I, that auntie. I'm everyone's inappropriate aunt. This is all I've ever wanted Do in you my know life. If anyone has that inappropriate aunt, you'll be at a family gathering and it's great you know and someone does something and she pulls out the receipts and it's like she keeps them here in her breast pockets and i'm just she like oh get it, get it. hold on <laughs> i've got receipts even then last year you loaned five thousand ikai but you've got a nice handbag anyway <laughs> I, I have been waiting my whole life to be an inappropriate aunt and now that my brother has five million children i am their inappropriate aunt but I'm also the inappropriate aunt of people on, you know, on Twitter as well. So, but it was rejected. So I was going to uh, self-publish and I found a publisher. Uh, no, I found an editor and she said to me, I'll take your money, but I really think you should give this to a major publisher. And I was like, what do you think I was doing before this baby? <laughs> I was just sitting at home waiting for an editor. She gave me two emails and to prove a point to her, I only emailed one person and that person is now my publisher, Andrea, who is the best. 
she is the reason why Intruders happened because I was looking for a place where I could post free stories and then Lauren Pierkus was like, no, that's not what we do. We don't give our word babies away for, for free, so no. Mm. And my publisher, who's a stalker, she, she was like, I saw what you and Lauren were talking about. Send me some. I just want to see if it's something we can publish. I was like, already, oh, babes. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the reason Intruders happened is because mm. Andrea believes in me. And it's so nice to have a publisher that believes in you and all the guys at Pan, and I'm not saying this because Balab. some are here, <laughs> but they're all very, very supportive and they know when I'm having my mental breakdowns, they talk to my boss, Marcia, and they make her do things or force me to do things. <laughs> so it's, it's nice. It's nice to be published. It's nice to be a writer, but it's also poopy face work mm. um <laughs> so i like to read the acknowledgements in your books because you know i have a best friend whose interest i must look out for and i really like the last line of of your of the acknowledgement for those you of say, you who have your bibles give us page <laughs> uh, lastly i would like to thank my dearest marcia for carrying my heart with her and you know what, as the Chiki natives, we think that at some point we must give Marcia land. Mm. Because yeah, like, yes. Ma Marcia is the Before reason I why get my land. we had the yearning, now we have intruders, and next year or two years from now, we'll have another book, and another mm. book, and another mm. book. Because Marcia is really like, she, you know, the she boss we yeah. deserve. Mm. She is the reason I'm alive, and I'm not saying that lightly. She's the reason why I'm alive because I was a depressed little suicidal person, mm. and she took me and she gathered me, and she does carry my heart. Sometimes it's okay to live without your heart for a while so you can get through the world, and my heart is in a safe place. So we have to and now she's, cry she's crying. Masia is crying for those of you who aren't here. <laughs> She's crying like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I love your friendship with Marcy because I think all the good and beautiful relationships you see between women in your stories come from come from that relationship with Marcy. Like Unatsia, guys, if I know how I feel about Unatsia and Marubini, but even even here, Bunola and Kamu, I think often all the all the and we don't we don't give enough credence to beautiful friendships between women. I think a lot of the time we think that women have the kind of friendships that are competitive. You know, most women are not allowed to dislike each other. So I dislike so many women. <laughs> so we never we never really give credit we're in a world that really places a lot of emphasis on romantic relationships and grooms women to place those kind of relationships above every kind of relationship that exists. And it's always so beautiful to see to see black women outside of Gail and Oprah just love each other publicly and in ways that are so good and so true and reflect in really good ways for how they, they live their lives. So, so thank you, Marsha. But Thanks, Marcia, Marcia, when is the Oprah money coming? Because you know I'm Gail. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm Gail and there's no money in books. Bestseller, guys. Bestseller. It's on the speed so I can get nice royalties. So, so please, can you make your Oprah money quickly? <laughs> no pressure. No, but she's the Oprah. I don't <laughs> no. um, for, we, we, let's just open it up for like five minutes, maybe for one or two questions, and then we have to the land. Or uh, Muhale Mashiko, now is the time for you to ask. If you have, we any, might not be in the presence of such greatness again for free. Uh, any questions? Go yes. to any wine bar, and you will find me there. <laughs> they are lying. <laughs> essay for this supplement yeah mail and guardian it was about how sometimes so I wouldn't have been published if it wasn't for my my editor who gave me 
two email addresses and I only emailed one person to prove a point that people hate me. And then what what happens is we need to start opening up the doors. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a trap door, sometimes get back door, but in my in my in my work as a writer, I always try to find another writer to say to say to the people who have the independent bookstores, this person has self-published, but it's a really good book. Can you just take five copies? And sometimes I find publishers who specialize in things and I say, this is a person you may want to talk to. Because if we don't do that, mm -hmm. then what's the point? I never want to be the only one. I never ever want to be the only one. Even with Kwezi, so our team after issue 16, we're going to hand over to a team. And they already have people who work in, in illustration and, and coloring. And I don't have a black woman to train. So if you guys know of a black woman who would love to be in comics, so that next year at Comic-Con, it's me and her. Mm -hmm. And the next year, it's me and her and somebody else. If you're the only one, then you've done it wrong. Mm -hmm. Any so other that's questions? what I do. Sure, that's, that's a quotable. Any other questions? Okay. Don't be shy, guys. All right. Uh, Mohale. I know somebody wants to ask a question. I just know. I can feel it. Mm. And I don't know if it's because I've drank too much water. <laughs> you have a question. No? <laughs> but I, I, no I, I'm, I'm just checking. Don't be shy. And then when I'm signing your book, you're telling me your life story when you had a chance <laughs> there to have it on, on the podcast. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so I'm kidding. Mohale, we... You know, we are a huge fan of your work since you the guys. uni. Now, intruders, and we will continue We're to like the original to 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 continue. <laughs> <laughs> we are the originals. We have first edition copies. I just want to put it out there. But we want to thank you also mm. for 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 this speculative fiction. Uh, but what I would say, an academic piece of work. Um, thank you for writing us back into history. I think that a lot of the works of black writers contemporary black writers is doing the work of not only archiving, but rewriting our stories, mm -hmm. right? So we know writers like Miriam Gladdy, who is said to be the first black woman to publish in English, right? Um, her books are not available anymore, but how can we read them? I paid so much money for a second-hand copy that's falling apart from the States. I'm ashamed to say how much I paid. But it's because it's not in print right because mm. then i wouldn't have to be ashamed of how much money i pay for a second hand copy that looks like somebody dunked it in water anyway you know that's that's an amazon issue not 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 a cheeky natives issue <laughs> so, please, please continue so thank you I, just thank you for for starting to do this important work yeah. of really writing our stories so i find that young children 20, 10 years from now can look back at this conversation but also read into this and be like oh wow like i didn't know this and now i do right or even now when we still tell our children about binky binky and um virus may go mm. that they can like start that. reading and and listening to this so thank you mm. all for the important work that you do thank you Marsha, for holding mahala accountable because we need more books mm. right. why accountable you could have said for holding her heart <laughs> like i said <laughs> <laughs> but um just to also echo what what Tafanola has said i think that with every book that you've written, we can see ourselves in it. So, I mean, The Yearning, my mother and I fought over the ending of The Yearning, right? Because she had her own opinion. I was like, you're so wrong. I've had this woman on my podcast. Like, <laughs> 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 like, and, and then she's like, well, firstly, I taught you to read. So you can just take a few steps back and breathe. Um, and then I read, I read The Intruders. And I'm like, yes, yes, I can relate. We all have an aunt, a cousin aggress somebody like this right and there's something so powerful about being able to see yourself in print or to see representations of yourself right like people always talk about representation but always make it seem like this cute thing that it's it means having one black person at the table or a middle class black or middle person class black person who table. speaks well and it's just like one of my best friends um I but like you're selling <laughs> us what's happening here <laughs> but, but, but there's something just so powerful about the fact that you continuously write these stories where we can look at ourselves and see ourselves and see who we hope to be over and over again um and just like constantly asking causing us to ask ourselves questions right it's like you can't have read the intruders and not walked out and ask yourself what it means to reimagine 
a post-apocalypse Joburg? What what does that mean for people who look like you, right? What because we always talk about mm, reimagining the future, but what does it mean to reimagine the future? And and these are personal questions that you ask of us over and over again, and you do it in such a great way that at the end of the book, you only realize after this, oh, actually, Mahana is asking me questions that I may not have the answers to mm -hmm. yet. Um, so but also to thank you for continuously just being available, like. On Twitter, I've seen people tweet you all the time and just be like, oh my God, they only nana, and all these things. And you're just constantly, constantly available and constantly accessible. And it just makes it so much easier for the people who will come after you to feel like there are people who look like me, who had the struggles that I had, and then still were able to tell these stories with such bravery and courage. And so we just want to thank you from wow. the cheeky natives. Thanks, guys. I don't know what to say, but thank you very, <laughs> thank Tina's you very much. <laughs> Um, you know, obviously, if you listen to the Cheeky Natives, this is the part where we give land. And the reason why we give land is because the land is coming. And we are the land committee. We will be handing out title deeds. I, I get the feeling I'm not getting land this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you still are, you know, the lush uh, wine farm that you have in Stella Marsh. You, you're still enjoying yourself. So what we will do is that there's a farm next to it. We're also giving you the, that farm mm. so that you can have a huge piece of land there in French Hook and enjoy yourself, right? You know, you as a person who studied all of this law are making these promises more and the people are... Uh, you can't go caught. <laughs> and you can see me. <laughs> you can't go caught. And, uh, you know, milady, I was obviously so hurt when there was no farm and I'm 60 now, milady. When can one expect a farm? <laughs> No, I think it's good because you have your land. So when the land comes and you're sitting on that beautiful farm and I can see you're doing like, you know, the Oprah specials where Oprah interviews people on her on her farm and people come and visit her on the farm. No, the people are not going to know my address. So no. Uh, no. I, I did try. I did try. I did so try. So where can people get a hold of you on the socials? I thought you meant what is my address. I was going to say, <laughs> what did I just say to you? On the social media. On the socials, I'm terrible at Facebook, and Marcia's fixing that. Uh, Marcia's <laughs> fixing my life. Uh, I'm usually on on Twitter and uh, Instagram. Sometimes I post my breasts, just <laughs> giving you a heads up. I posted a dress and I was saying ready for braless season. And then Bob brother in my DMs, had tat had can't wait for summer. <laughs> but it wasn't, there was no nip or nothing. It was, guys, it was like this. Oh, can't wait for summer, come to Lagos. <laughs> well, that's how she's been. She's been talking about Nigeria. So, she was in Nigeria. I was like, oh, brother who hopped into her DMs from Lagos on Instagram. Please do the things because, wow, she's really in Lagos. So, I occasionally post my cleavage, no nip. You know, I'm trying to keep it clean because I write books <laughs> <laughs> and I have to inspire the children. <laughs> uh, but just, <laughs> I'm Black Porcelain on Twitter and Instagram. And don't worry, there's not going to be any more things. <laughs> Black Porcelain without an A, yes. So it's BLCK. But that thing is not there anymore. So <laughs> don't worry. So thank you very much for coming to the Cheeky Natives. Obviously, we know you'll be a resident guest here because when book another book is coming, we will welcome you with open arms. <laughs> and so much of land. Mm. Always. I can't wait to sue you. I'm so happy <laughs> for <laughs> to it. <laughs> so again, thank you very much, Mohale Mashiko, um, for writing our stories back into history. And thank you very much for being a supporter of the Cheeky Natives and the work that we're trying to do at the Cheeky Natives. I think you guys are doing amazing work because it's one thing to write a book where you want people to be seen, but for people to actually break down the books and, you know, have a gathering and actually talk like this, this is, this is really cool. And I'm so glad to have been your first supporter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you can obviously shout out to our favorite bookstore, Bridge Books. Uh, if you want to get a book at Bridge Books, you can get The Yearning and Intruders. Uh, you can just use Cheeky Voucher and get a 10% discount. 
Um, because you know we love people who buy books mm. so we want to give them a celebration of the books and we say this on every episode but until you guys stop your foolery we're not going to stop please stop asking authors for free books it costs money to have books printed please stop asking for pdfs please stop borrowing your friend's copy to borrow another friend who's going to borrow the friend please buy a copy like it is so important for us to buy books and to give to give platforms to black writers. We cannot hope to grow the canon of black literature if we don't support black writers. And we're doing this so that in 10 years' time, when someone who looks like Mohali wants to write and publish a book, the publisher is going to be like, oh, you know, I had such great success with the Mohali. How dare I not give you a chance? And we're doing this. We're doing this not just for the now, but for the future as well. Even for you, Mohali. Bestseller. 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 This is us, the Chicken Haters, and Mohali signing out. Thank Bye. You.